Today's sermon is entitled Spiritual Armor. Uh, we're looking at Ephesians 6, verses 13 through 17. Well, last week, we began this final section of this great letter of the Apostle Paul, a section that you might call the armor of God, especially from verses 10 down through verse 18. Well, this is going to be our theme for the rest of the book to the very end of verse 24. The last time we concentrated on verses 10 and 11 uh, through 11, in that passage we said that although Paul's well aware that we face a number of different kinds of challenges in the Christian life, I mean things like our own sinfulness, the sinfulness of other people that we experience and we have to learn how to forgive them and the allurements of the world or the opposition of the world that we face, all of these are part of the obstacles that we face in living the Christian life in a fallen world and also in, in churches full of sinners of which we are one. But Paul especially wants us to think in this passage about the satanic or the demonic opposition that we face in living the Christian life. And he wants us to realize that our battle is not ultimately against flesh and blood. Now as we looked at Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 11 last week, we saw four things that Paul wanted to emphasize. And first of all, he wanted to emphasize the war itself, that we are at war. The fact that the context of our discipleship, the context of our growth in grace is a war zone. That is where God has chosen to grow us up in a war zone. And that it's important for all Christians, young and old, to realize that. Knowing that this war is never going to cease until the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the, the bottom of the sea. So we re recognize that from now until Jesus returns, the context of our Christian living is going to be in a war. And that's a life-changing truth. Because if we live our lives expecting peace in this world, or if we expect to make, the, to make peace with this world, if we expect some sort of comprehensive peace treaty declared on the part of the world with us, and certainly on the part of Satan with us, then we're delusional. So when we face this kind of opposition, we really shouldn't be surprised or discouraged. We should recognize when that opposition comes, that well, that's precisely what God told us we would face in, in, this, in this world. And it's yet another proof of the truth of His Word. But secondly, Paul wants us to understand that this war is a war where we need the Lord's strength in order to win. It's not a war that we have the innate abilities or capacities or an equipment to win. Our strength is inadequate. And therefore, Paul will say in verse 10, Be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. And his emphasis is on having God's strength in order to fight this war. Then thirdly, in verse 11, Paul had emphasized that we needed divine protection. We have to put on God's armor in order to stand against the devil. But he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And then fourthly, Paul wants us to make sure that we never underestimate our enemy. Because our battle is one which is ultimately not against human enemies. This battle is ultimately against the powers, against the cosmic forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And we spent some time last week thinking about the implications of that for living the Christian life. Well, this week we're going to look at verses 13 through 17. In these verses, Paul details six main pieces of equipment worn by a well-armed Roman soldier. He points to his belt, his breastplate, his boots, his shield, his helmet, and his sword. Now today we're just going to look at the first five of those, and then next time we'll look at, look at the sword. You can imagine Paul under a house arrest. He would have had plenty of time to look at the armament of a Roman soldier. So you don't have to be very bright to figure out where this illustration comes from. But he uses it as a picture, doesn't he, of the importance of six things. If we're going to stand against the principalities and powers in this world. And those six things are truth, righteousness, the good news of reconciliation, faith, salvation, and the Word of God. Before we read God's Word, let's ask the Lord's uh, blessing on it. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this, Your Word, and we ask that You would bless our study of it. You would make it profitable to our souls. Lord, will You bring to our mind, even as this Word is illustrated and applied today, bring to our minds illustrations from our own experience and applications to our particular situation. Lord, uh, will You open this passage to our understanding and uh, sanctify us, uh, transform us for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is God's Word, beginning in Ephesians 6, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. That Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, 
And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. May God write the eternal truths of his word upon your heart and mine. Paul's main point in this passage is simply this. Arm yourself spiritually for what you're up against. I mean, he's tried to remind us that we are at war. Uh, he's already reminded us that we need spiritual weaponry and God's strength in order to fight this war. He has reminded us that our enemy is ultimately not flesh and blood. Rather, it is Satan and the principalities and powers and cosmic forces of darkness in the heavenly places. And so he's saying, arm yourself spiritually for what you're up against. And the main thing he wants us to say to us is we need weapons that have not been forged by human beings. We need weapons that have been forged in God. We need weapons that have been made by God, supplied to us by God, if we're going to be able to stand in this battle. Remember that in the Old Testament, God himself is pictured as a warrior on behalf of his people. He is a warrior who fights for us, defends us, and protects us. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, we see some of the very same imagery, the helmet, the breastplate, and the belt applied to God. And Paul knows that, and he expects most of his hearers to know their Bibles well enough that they'll be able to remember it as well. And so when he speak, begins to speak to them about putting on their helmets and their breastplate and girding their loins with their belt and shotting their feet with their battle boots, he knows that they will remember that God has already done that for them. And so here there's a sense in which they and we are simply being asked to take the armaments which God himself has provided for us in order to fight the war in which we find ourselves. Notice again, especially in verses 11, 12, and 13, how over and over Paul emphasizes what he wants us to do. It's when, the enemy, when the assault of the enemy comes, he wants us to be able to stand firm. Notice in, in uh, verse 11, 12, and 13 how often this is stated. So verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you may be able to stand. And again in verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. What's the exhortation of verse 14? He says, stand therefore. Do you think Paul's concerned about our standing firm? Well, absolutely. Because an unsteady Christians who have no firm foothold in Christ are easy prey for the devil. Therefore, he wants us equipped so that we're able to withstand and to stand firm against the assaults of the evil one. And it's not a question of if it's coming. The question is, when is it coming? He wants us to be strong and stable in the midst of the assaults of the evil one. And so he takes up this picture of the full armor in order to equip us to be strong in the midst of these assaults. He's pointing us to the outfitting of a heavily armed Roman soldier. And he's emphasizing the fact, especially in verse 13, that this armor comes from God. That's why he calls it the whole armor of God. And though we may tend to focus on the specific parts of the armor, and rightly so, first Paul wants us to remember primarily that this armor comes from God. It is God's armor given to us. And he wants us to know that because, the, uh, because spiritual weaponry is really the only thing that will avail in resisting Satan. There's nothing that anything man-made can do. It is in this evil day against Satan and against the world and against the flesh. On that which is supplied by, only that which is supplied by God will avail. So Paul is concerned that we understand that if we're going to be able to stand firm and hold our ground in the evil day, we need to have six things. And I said earlier, we're only going to look at the first five. We'll come back to the last one next week because it's so important. It's really a summary, a summarizing truth about the Word of God. <clears throat> so this morning, five things. Truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, and salvation. So point one on our outline, then. We must have truth. Now listen to what he says in verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. The NAS says, having girded your loins with truth. The wrapping of truth around one's waist derives from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5. It says, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. This is like saying we need truth in the inner parts. So Paul is, is saying, so is Paul talking about 
truth in the sense of, of doctrine? Or does he mean truth in the sense of integrity or faithfulness? Well, commentators wrestle with that. But I think verse 14 acts as a vivid metaphor to reiterate Paul's earlier reminder that as Christians, we have embraced the truth found in Christ Jesus. We saw that in chapter 4, verse 21 in his gospel. Glance across the page there at chapter 4, verse 21, where Paul is, is speaking about learning, in, learning Christ. And he says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. And the ability to be strong in the Lord is derived from the Lord. Look at, at, back at verse 10. And his calling and his inaugurated new creation life through the purification of Christ. And it is the fruit of genuine saving faith. And therefore, the truth is given to the church in the gospel on which we stand. And we must have truth worked into our hearts. And that truth produces a sincerity of mind and heart, an integrity, if we're going to be able to stand in the, e the day of evil. When the gospel permeates our lives, it affects everything that we are and everything we do. So that we're a people of truth and integrity. And then we're increasingly able to resist the devil in the evil day. You know, we sometimes hear people talk about how the church needs authenticity. Now, without getting into all the things that they may mean by that, I think it is a good point. And one reason we hear that kind of criticism is because many people in our generation have experienced the church that is a facade. You know, I mean, sometimes pagans in the world are more authentic and even treat us better than people in the church treat us. People who look religious on the outside, but who are not devoted to the glory of God and to His Word. And sometimes the church is a place where people won't own their own sin. I mean, confession and repentance feels like death to them. And so they go on pretending and ignoring root problems. They don't want to deal with heart issues. And so people's inner life and the outworkings of that life in their external life, well, they don't jive. <laughs> Perhaps you've heard that old Puritan saying, What a man is on his knees alone with God, that he is and no more. And of course, the point of that is the reality of our profession is directly tied to that inward experience of the living God and communion with Him. From that inward communion with God flows everything that we do and are in this life. That means deeply embracing the gospel and the implications of the gospel and living a life of confession, repentance, and faith. We, we can't change our own hearts. We've said that many times throughout our study. Only God can do that. You know, sanctification in the Christian life is not merely behavior modification. If it was, then we could do most of that on our own. So when we humble ourselves and we admit our sins and we confess our sins, we repent of them and we trust in Jesus and we ask God to change our hearts, resting in Jesus' righteousness, realizing that our perceived righteousness is filthy rags before a holy God and the standard of His law. Well, that's true authenticity. But Satan loves it when he can lure us to not confess our sins, just to hold our ground, you know, act religious. He loves to whisper in our ear, you know, you're, you're, you're better than that. You're better than they are. So that we'll be proud and unforgiving and unwilling to love. And Paul's saying, you understand that your great weapon against that temptation of Satan is to have the truth of Christ and his gospel so rooted in your inner being that you are on the outside what you are on the inside. You're authentic and although sinful, you are a person of integrity because you own your stuff. You deal with heart issues. You don't just ignore it. You don't just put on a religious facade. Paul says that's absolutely necessary in order to resist the assault of Satan. The second thing you see in verse 14, it's the second half of that verse, is Paul's emphasis on righteousness. So point two, we must have a life characterized by striving after godly living. He says in verse 14b, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And Paul says, put on righteousness as your breastplate, just as you fasten truth around the, the belt of truth around your waist. So whose righteousness is it? Well, it must be Christ's divine righteousness. Again, I think this is a reference 
to God as our divine warrior in, in, in Isaiah. Listen to chapter 53 there, verse 11, speaking of the Lord's servant, ultimately Jesus. He says, Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the, right, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So our righteousness comes from Jesus' own messianic breastplate. It's granted to every believer in justification by faith alone as a gift. And this righteousness produces its fruit in the individual's integrity, in the church's own integrity, in godly living, which adorns our profession of Christ. Our integrity and any measure of godly living springs up as a fruit from the free gift of Christ's own righteousness that's sent from above. Basically, our growth in grace is never apart from the imputed righteousness of Christ to us. So that we are grounded and accepted by God because of a righteousness that is not in us. So also, more and more, we grow in the work of the Spirit into being more like Christ. And so I think Paul's telling us that out of that righteousness of Christ that's credited to us, so that we're accepted not because of what we've done, but because of what He's done, and not because of what we deserve, but because of what Christ has done and because of what He deserves. Out of that imputed righteousness flows a life in which we are serious about growing in godly living. The kind of life which is essential for the battle with Satan because he wants to attack our consciences. Think about this in light of the story of David when he sinned with Bathsheba. Now we know David wasn't apostatizing from the faith at that point because we know the end of the story. Maybe we've had some friends in our lives that if we've seen go down a road of sin just like that, and they've, they've never come back from it. It's very sad. It's fri it frightens us because it appears to us that they possibly never have grasped grace in the first place because, well, they've rejected repentance. They've rejected God's word. They, they live like they want to live. It seems that they don't have any conviction, which would be evidence that Holy Spirit indwells them. They've worshiped themselves and their own desires. Maybe you could have said that about David earlier in his story. But in David's case, he, he did repent. And he was fully aware of the depth and the grievousness of his sin. He, he poured out his heart to God in repentance. So consider this question. After David had sinned grievously, was he any less justified? Was he declared any less righteous by God because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ than he was before that sin? No. But he was more assured of God's grace to him before he sinned grievously or during the months in his sin and eventual repentance? Because David himself tells us the answer to the question. He says in Psalm 32, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. In other words, because of that unrepentant sin, he was a miserable, troubled soul. He lost his sense of acceptance and forgiveness and the transforming work of Holy Spirit and, and the, work, the forgiving work of God in him based on not on him, but on God's grace. He lost that sense of the fullness of assurance and if we don't have that sense of being engaged in, in the life of sanctification in which by the Holy Spirit we're made more and more like Christ, well, then Satan will accuse us. He'll say, you hypocrite. And so ironically, our own growth in grace is both important for our assurance and for our ability to stand against the accusations of the evil one. And in no way, it's not trying to prove ourselves, you know, to somehow make ourselves more worthy before God. It's not that at all. Rather, it's a dynamic of the working out of our, salvation, of our sanctification. So that just as David was able to regain a sense of his assurance of salvation after his repentance that he could have, had not experienced while he was in that state of temporary unrepentance. Well, thirdly, in verse 15, we have a readiness which flows from the gospel Paul goes on to say that in order to resist the assaults of the evil one and stand firm in the day of evil, we not only need integrity, we not only need righteousness or holiness, we need, we need gospel experience and gospel motivation. We, we must have a readiness that flows from the gospel. He says, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now again, 
The Roman half boot, it was designed to enable the soldiers to have flexibility and yet stand firm in the day of battle. You know, it's like football players wear cleats so they have a good grip when they make various moves on the football field. The, the Roman soldier had these half boots so that he was able to stand firm in the day of battle. And Paul's reminding us here that our ability to stand firm in the day of evil is dependent upon our having experienced the effect of the gospel. What is the effect of the gospel? Well, it's the realization that we have peace with God, that we're accepted by God, that because of the finished work of Jesus on our behalf that we have received through the instrument of faith, God's favor has been turned upon us and that God's desires for us is the fullness of His blessing. That we are reconciled with all our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're, we're in the same family. We love one another. We're at peace with them also. And we're seeking their best interest and ours. And so the great effect of the gospel is peace with God and peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that in turn compels us to share the gospel with others. Because we want others to experience that peace with God. And that peace with brothers and sisters. And so Paul is saying here that to resist the devil, we must have this experience of peace with God and with our brothers and sisters that only the gospel can effect. And that peace in turn prepares us and it motivates us to share the gospel with others so that they might enjoy that same peace. Again, what does Satan do when he brings accusations against us? He says, God doesn't love you savingly. I mean, you haven't been made right with God. You haven't been reconciled to God. And look at you. You, you. you haven't made any progress in godly living. I mean, look at all these besetting sins that you have. God's too pure to look at that. You haven't been reconciled to Him. But it's not what we do. It's what Jesus has done on our behalf. That's the gospel. And Paul's saying you're not ready to do battle with Satan until you know that you're at peace with God. Because if you're at peace with Him, then there's no one left to fear. Not even Satan. However, if you're not sure that you're at peace with him, then there's no situation that's more fearful. And Satan knows that, and he's going to exploit it. So this is going to rob us of our boldness and of the authority that we ought to have in this world. You know, when the world sees a Christian with a clean conscience who's at peace with God, knowing what he believes is what God has written and what God has taught and not what he's just made up on his own, then that man, that woman, is frightening to the world. Because that man or that woman doesn't fear the world because they're at peace with God. And Paul says, you must have that knowledge of the peace of God if you're going to be able to stand against the schemes of the evil one. And then he says in verse 16, that, that all circumstance, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So fourthly, we have to have a living trust in God. So he points us not only to integrity and righteousness and not only to gospel experience, but also to faith. In other words, we must have a living trust in God if we're going to be able to stand against the evil one. Do you remember when Polycarp, you know, the 84-year-old pastor from Ephesus, he'd been chained to, to logs and he was being prepared for a bonfire by his Roman captives. They were, going to, they were taunting him before they burned him alive. And he said, and they said to him, where is your hope now? I mean, don't you want to call out for mercy to Caesar? And to the gods, rather than die this horrible death? You remember Polycarp's response? Eighty-four years I have served Christ and He has never done me wrong. Am I to begin not trusting Him now? His trust, His confidence was entirely in Christ. There was nothing that could make Him for, uh, afraid. And so Paul is saying, if your trust is entirely in God, then exactly what circumstance, even what demonic circumstance in this world can cause you to fear? Because greater is he who is in you than he is who is in the world. And so if your trust is in him and if he's the sovereign God over all things, then what circumstance, what opposition can break you down? But you have to have your trust in him in order to stand because I do not for a moment want to make light of any circumstances here. You know, if, if I were simply to recount the circumstances and tests that have been endured by, you know, just some members of our congregation who are listening to this sermon, just in the time I've known you, it would be enough to crush the most resolute pagans, but not the woman, not the man who is trusting in God. 
And then fifthly and finally this morning uh, in verse 17, notice that he tells us what we need to do is to take up the helmet of salvation. So point five, we have to have the assurance of our assurance of salvation. That is, Paul is saying that if we're going to stand firm in the day of evil, we have to have a vital hope, a vital sense of God saving us and, and, uh, from present and future. And Paul's saying that the knowledge that we're saved and secure, the knowledge that nothing can pluck us from God's hand, you know, the, the knowledge of, of Romans 8, neither death nor life nor angels nor powers nor principalities nor nakedness nor famine nor peril nor sword can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. The knowledge that we are God's, that we belong to Him, uh, and, and we're kept by Him, we're saved by Him, we are safe and secure in Him, that's vital to the whole of the Christian life. In other words, to resist the devil, we have to be assured of our salvation. What does Satan off, so often do? Well, he attacks Christians at the point of their assurance, and he kind of leaves them tied up in knots wondering, does God love me or does He love me not? You know, am I saved or have I fallen away? Am I backsliding or have I fallen out the door of the, of the kingdom or am I saved? Am I in Christ or out? Am I justified or not? Am I God's child or not? And Paul is saying the helmet of salvation is to be assured of your security, you know, past, present, and future. Nothing can pluck you out of God's hand. And he's saying if you know that, just what is it that Satan can do? What can he threaten to take away from you? All these things, Paul says, we need if we're going to be fully armored to take on the principalities and powers and spiritual forces of darkness in high places that are arrayed against us. But none of them, none of them are a match for the armor that God supplies. So let's look to, let's look to Jesus in faith, repent of our sins, put our trust in Him, and trust God to work all these things out for our good and for His glory. Our Lord and our God, we, we ask that You will help us take these things to heart, work them so deeply into our lives that we can't possibly miss them. Lord, uh, give us assurance of our salvation, that we could stand against the temptations of Satan, all of his schemes. And we ask that we would stand firm till the end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.